Jody Avergan here. I'm glad you're enjoying 30 for 30 podcast, part of a special collection of sports audio documentaries from ESPN Films. We're finding the best sports stories for you right now. And to do that, we're behind the wheel of the Mini Countryman, the biggest mini yet. Please proceed to the highlighted round. To find great sports stories, you have to get out into the world and follow your instincts. That's where the Mini Countryman's all-wheel drive comes in handy. With all four, we can chase down a story in the city, the country, and most places in between. Podcast equipment isn't very bulky, but even if we're hauling a lot of gear, there's plenty of cargo space for all your stuff. And if a few of our producers tag along, no problem. The Mini Countryman comfortably seats five adults. The Countryman may be big, but it still drives like a Mini thanks to the twin power turbo engine. No matter what story you're chasing, the Mini Countryman will help you find it. It's available now, and so are 30 for 30 podcasts. Visit miniusa.com slash countrymen today. This is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday. Over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, that's 98.7 FM New York City, that's 710 ESPN LA, and of course nationwide over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, that's Sirius XM style, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 866-729-3776, that's 866-729-ESPN, 866-SAY-ESPN. Lots of stuff to get into today. Um, it's it's very. I, I watched the entire Lakers-Warriors game last night. I was vacillating back and forth, actually, watching them and watching the New York Knicks, watching Porzingis get hurt with his fragile self. He's big time, but he's fragile. Watch Lonzo Ball look a little bit aggressive. I was very, very pleased with that, okay? And I'd like to say that out front, and I'll be talking about that as the show progresses today. But I wanted to get back in to Eli Manning. And it wasn't just because Philip Rivers came to his defense, speaking up on his behalf, talking about how respected and revered he is throughout NFL circles uh, in the aftermath of the Giants electing to bench him in favor of Eli Manning. 210 consecutive starts coming to an unceremonious end. Uh, two and nine, the Giants are on this season. It does. Here's the thing. It's got me asking some questions. It's obviously, uh, to me, the end of, for Jerry Reese and, 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 and Ben McAdoo has arrived. Uh, ben McAdoo should have never been a head coach for this team, even if you wanted to replace it with Tom Coughlin. Wanted to replace Tom Coughlin. It shouldn't have been with him. That's number one. Number two, um, he's really shown no ability, no propensity whatsoever to ingratiate himself uh, with the um, <clears throat> New York NFL community. And that's why he'll be out the door the minute the season is over. We know he's gone. Can't have it. People are not going to come and support the New York Giants as long as Ben McAdoo is the coach. He has to go. It's just that simple. And, Reese, you've had enough time to get an offensive line for Eli Manning. You tried, but you were unsuccessful. Ultimately, as Bill Parcells said once, you are what your record says you are. And that's what this really comes down to. And the reality is is that the New York Giants have been to the playoffs just one time since winning the Super Bowl back in 2011. That's six years. This will be five times in six years that the New York Giants are on the outside looking in at the playoffs. Here's the question. If Ben McAdoo goes and Jerry Reese has to go, what's the big fuss about the fact that Eli Manning probably should be on his way out as well? Now, I'm not one of those people who support what the New York Giants did. I went off about that yesterday, about how classless it was or what have you. And Phillip Rivers spoke about that as well. And we'll, we'll hopefully we're, we're hoping to hear from him and what he had to say. But I know uh, that he had obviously a lot to say, and he was very, very upset at what transpired with Eli Manning. But before I even go into Eli Manning and what Phillip Rivers had to say, let me hear, let you hear from Phillip Rivers himself. I honestly thought it was pathetic, really. You know, he's, he's, he's been out there 210 straight games with no telling how many bumps and bruises and injuries. Won two Super Bowls, uh, MVPs, uh, the respect he's had in the locker room over the years, really the respect he's gained throughout the league. You feel like the guys earned the opportunity if they are deciding, in fact, to to go another direction. You feel like he's earned the opportunity to finish it off. Well, you heard that. You heard Philip Rivers, right? And ladies and gentlemen, did it ever occur to you that he may be saying, first of all, you can look at it two ways. Number one, he's speaking as a, you know, as a defender of one of his comrades uh, in the NFL, Eli Manning. 
Remember, Eli Manning got drafted by the San Diego Chargers, didn't want to play for them, and ultimately the Chargers had to swap him, uh, you know, who was the first overall pick, and, and, and position themselves to get Phillip Rivers in return, which is what ended up happening. We can look at it from that perspective, but we can also look at it from this perspective if you're, if you're a, a fan of Phillip Rivers. He's only made the playoffs once in the last seven years. Eli Manning made it once in the last five. So maybe he's speaking because he wants to damn sure make sure that don't happen to him. And it's fine. It's, it's very, very interesting when you look at it from that perspective because the legitimate question that needs to be asked is whether indeed it is time for the New York Giants to move beyond Eli Manning. And one would argue, even with the Chargers playing the way that they're playing, having won games recently, two of their last three, two of their last four, they won back-to-back games against Buffalo and against Dallas. They're now 5-6 and six and back in the playoff position. They're in a position to control their own destiny in terms of taking the AFC West. Phillip Rivers is still your quarterback. He's completing 62% of his passes around the same as Eli. He's got 20 touchdowns, 7 interceptions. He's passed for nearly 3,000 yards. His quarterback rating is 95. But Phillip Rivers is 36 years of age. And you do have to ask yourself, how long should the Chargers stick with him? Just like how long should the the New York Giants stick with Eli Manning? See, the real problem, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Eli Manning is your starter. I'm sorry, Geno Smith is your starter. It's the real problem. Because if we're really being honest about it, let me just state for the record, I'm a black man. And I got a problem. With this dude being the first African-American quarterback that's going to be starting for the New York Giants in its history. I mean, you could do better. Let's just call it what it is. I mean, it's so bad right now that Jada Kiss and Fabulous came on the rap artist, the hip-hop artist, Jada Kiss and Fabulous, came on first take this morning just to reiterate those comments. And they're brothers. But you can't support benching Eli Manning for Geno Smith. You want to go the direction of Davis Webb because you want to find out what he is and what he has before you make a decision as to whether or not you should move beyond Eli? That kind of makes sense. But to go the direction of Geno Smith when he has already played and performed and has been booed and excoriated by the same local fan base, it ain't like he stunk up to join in Denver or L.A. Or Charlotte, meaning Carolina, or somebody like that. Oh, no, Geno Smith stuck up the joint in New York City. Now, I am hopeful that he will be able to resurrect his career. I am hopeful that he will do just fine because I'm not wishing anything negative on the brother. I'm just being honest with you about how he has looked. And, oh, by the way, I don't want to hear any excuses about how he was en route to a successful season, but I.K. Enum Pala ruined it by breaking his jaw. You owed the brother money. He's a 250-pound linebacker. And not only did you not pay him back, but you got in his face and basically said, what the hell are you going to do about the fact that I'm not going to pay you the money that I owe you for a trip I was supposed to make to speak at your camp? I didn't show up. After having you booked the trip, and then I'm going to talk mess about you. And then he japped you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, whose fault is that? That ain't Todd Bowles' fault. That ain't McCagnin's fault. That ain't anybody on the New York Jets' fault but Geno Smith. So when I see the reporter extraordinaire that is Josina Anderson on ESPN yesterday who covers the NFL just as well as anybody in this day and age. When I see her coming to the defense of Geno Smith talking about fairness, well, I got to go with my boy Jeff in L.A., my man Jeff Brown, who lives in L.A., who I've known since high school, with his classic line, fair is a place where they judge pigs. It does not exist. I want to hear about what's fair in terms of judging Geno Smith. You had your moment. You stunk up the joint. New York has every right to say, oh, hell no. Not this dude if you're going to bitch Eli Manning. Not this dude. New Yorkers have every right to say that. Period. 
But others might feel like, hey, it's time to move beyond Eli. And my point is, if you feel it's time to move beyond Eli, can't you say the same things about Phil Rivers? I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-SAY-ESPN. Your phone calls and more in a minute. Plus, I want to get into how the NFL is committing $89 million over seven years to partner with players on a plan to address social issues. And how some players are still unhappy with that. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Want to be a part of the show? It's Stephen A. Up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to GEICO. I've never felt more alive. Disclaimer, GEICO cannot guarantee you will feel more alive. You either possess functioning respiratory and circulatory systems, or you do not, or you are a zombie. If you are indeed a brain-starved zombie and you would like to save money on car insurance, the GEICO legal team applauds your excellent life choices, even in your shambling afterlife. But we strongly encourage you to visit GEICO.com or download the GEICO app. Please stay a minimum of 500 feet away from our large and presumably delicious, delicious brains. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. Before I get to the phone calls, I want to say this. Um, I'm very, very pleased on a couple of fronts. If you are a New York Knicks fan, the fact that Porzingis had his ankle twisted even though the test came back negative, no breakage, that was a nasty, you know, when he got his ankle stepped on and had to be removed from the game, Knicks still blew out Miami. That's a very good thing. I'm happy about that because it's showing. And listen, and, and they, they they lost their last three games before last night. Enos Cantor didn't play. Enos Cantor comes back. He drops 22. They win. Talks a lot of smack. Feels it's his job to come across the way that he comes across. Damn it, it's working for him. Let's go with it. I ain't gonna sweat. I ain't gonna. I'm not gonna sweat it. I mean, if it works for him, if it works for him. So be it. All good. Let me get to the Lakers. Because there's a few things that I saw last night that I think are important to mention. First of all, my God, Steph Curry is just so special. I mean, I get, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, I love that song, I love L.A., because I do love L.A. Palm trees, sunshine. Let's just say the scenery, without me getting too specific, is just spectacular. And I love being out there. I'm depressed whenever I'm not out there. Like right now. So let me be very, very clear. Having said all of that, okay, I was born and raised a New Yorker. New York will always be in my heart. And when I think about the fact that the New York Knicks were one pick away from drafting Steph Curry, because that's exactly what Mike D'Antoni would have done. If the Knicks had the seventh pick instead of the eighth pick back in 2008, all right, they would have grabbed Steph Curry. Instead, they ended up with Jordan Hill. I mean, I just get depressed just thinking about it. It breaks my heart because I think this dude is the greatest shooter I've ever seen in my life. Steph Curry, I'm just not concerned. I mean, who didn't know that once the game went to overtime last night between the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors that Steph Curry wasn't going to do what he did? Who didn't know that? Rocky all night long comes out and hits three threes, scores 13 points in overtime, Golden State Warriors win. And by the way, Mr. Kevin Durant, quiet, get efficient as ever, 29 points, 12 or 25 shooting. I mean, this dude is on another level. And then we got to take into account what we saw from the Lakers. I must confess, I was very proud of Lonzo Ball last night. I was very proud. I thought he was aggressive, particularly in that second half. Actually, they big. I mean, when you know it's bad when the crowd is screaming at you to shoot, 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 and you pass up not one three pointer but two three pointers. You're wide open. You won't shoot. The crowd is just looking at you like, "What the hell is wrong with you?" But then ultimately, 
he launched a couple of threes and made them. Made made two in a row. Almost, I, I mean, I was like Fred. I was like Fred Sanford from Sanford to Son Elizabeth. I'm coming up to join you on it. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So I was very proud of him. But you know who I'm growing increasingly impressed with? Brandon Ingram. Former number two overall pick himself, finished with 32 last night, going up against Kevin Durant. Too damn skinny. Needs to get in the weight room. It's about all. Don't get me wrong. He needs to improve his jump shot. Or, or no question about it. But his athleticism and his go-get-it mentality, I saw that last night. I really, really did. I saw that last night. And I got to tell you something right now. I was very impressed. Got to make those free throws in overtime. Got to make things happen. But Brandon Ingram, he's growing on me. Julius Randle coming off the bench, finishing with 20 points on 9 of 13 shooting, a plus 11 with him on the floor. He's growing on me. They didn't even have Kuzma last night. And they pushed this game into overtime. The Golden State Warriors are just too explosive, y'all. They score in bunches. I mean, in the blink of an eye. It's not that they could come back from a a 20-point deficit. They do it before you blink. I watched them against the Philadelphia 76ers a week ago. And I saw a team that was down 23 points. 23, 24 points. Ladies and gentlemen, they outscored the Sixers. 47-14 47-14 to 14 in the third quarter. Just like that. It's unreal to watch this team. To watch how they could just explode. From Durant, and, and listen, Klay Thompson is your third option. Do you understand that Klay Thompson, the son of our colleague here at 710 ESPN LA, Michael Thompson, do y'all understand what y'all are watching when y'all are watching him? Are you ready for this, Nuno? Are you ready for this, Jonathan and Kat? Do y'all understand that Klay Thompson may end up going in the Hall of Fame? Are we really, truly appreciated? We know that Steph Curry and Kevin Durant are given. I mean, they're just too phenomenal. But do you understand that in Klay Thompson, you're actually looking at a Hall of Famer somewhere down the line? He's one of the greatest shooters we've ever seen. Steph Curry is the greatest shooter on the planet. He's the greatest shooter I've ever seen in the history of basketball. And guess what? Klay Thompson might be too. This brother's lethal and he's your third option. The brother doesn't miss. He just had a quiet 20 points last night on 6 of 12 shooting. So obviously I I was being facetious. Of course he misses, but you know what I'm saying. This is what it is. Contavious Caldwell Pope. I like what I saw from him last night. I really did. I was pleased with what I saw from Clarkson and Randall, even though it was a lot of one-on-one. But Randall, the energizer that he is, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I got news for you. The Lakers have some young talent on this team. They need two things. Lonzo to continue to play the way that he played last night, showing aggression. They need that. Make you guard him. They need that. That and Magic Johnson and Rob Palenka need to go out and get a three-point shooter. When I look at the New York Knicks, you know why I bring them up? Because everything that I thought about Lonzo not being aggressive is exactly what I think about Nilakina. He gives me nothing, y'all. I'm not sold on this guy. I'm not going to lie to you. If if I could, I'd ship him back to France. He gives me nothing offensively. Nothing. I know he plays defense. He gives me nothing offensively. And you could have had Dennis Smith Jr. and Laurie Markkinen. Well, actually, you could have had Markkinen. But you could have had Dennis Smith Jr. You could have had Malik Malik Monk out of Kentucky. You could have had Donovan Mitchell, who landed in Utah. You could have had any of those three. Neil Aquina doesn't do it for me, y'all. Actually, I think he's been worse than Lonzo. 866-SAY-ESPN. Your calls are more than a minute with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Let's get right to it. Let's get to the phones. 
866 say ESPN. Fidel, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Yo, what's up, Stephen? How you doing? Go ahead. What's going on, man? How you doing? What's up, man? Um, I talked to you about two weeks ago in regards to Lonzo Ball and his assist and rebound. Oh, and we were talking about well, how. You, uh, you know what? You have... Stop, stop. You know why y'all annoy me with, when you start off questions like that? Let me tell you why. Because I'm on every day. You act like you got to look for me. You know what I'm saying? You, you, don't remind callers that, you know what, somehow you sneak through the air the airways when thousands of people are calling me every day for the show. What, what What's your point? Um, my point is that I believe he's doing better than most uh, rookies in those fields. And a point that you always uh, point towards is his shooting. But, nope, not um, true. I always point to his lack of aggression. I don't care so about his shooting. his shooting. Correct. Well, I pointed it out a couple of times because it made news the fact that his shooting percentage was the worst of anybody in their first 20 games in 30 years. But the reality was I still said religiously, I don't care right now. What I care about is his aggression, his assertiveness, which I was very pleased with what I saw last night. Right, myself too. But I believe that that assertiveness assertiveness comes with a sense of um, confidence, which comes from your shot. And uh, just one thing I wanted to point out was that uh, Jackson is shooting like 23% from the – or no, I'm sorry, Lonzo shooting about 23 from the three-pointer. Jackson, 27%. Fox, about 26%. Nila Kina, 24 The only people shooting over 30% are uh, Monk and Mitchell. Who That's said it? Hard. But why are you bringing up three-point shooting to me? I don't care about Lonzo Ball shooting is, three-pointers. My point is that the confidence is going to come. And the one thing that you can fix in the NBA is a job. And so I'm not uh, – my point is, is as, a, as a Laker fan, I'm not concerned. Okay. That's something so, that so, so, in other words, you, so in other words, you called to say that you're not concerned. I, no, I you, called you, to say you, that that's not something we should focus on so much. Well, I don't not, focus on it not, but so much. not, in your words, be petrified over it. Oh, hell yeah, I'm petrified. I'm petrified if you're not showing any heart. I'm petrified of people getting up in your chest and you don't respond to a challenge just like I would be petrified with a boxer that doesn't throw punches. I want to see you aggressive. I want to see you going after it. I want to see you hungry to show that you're worthy of being a number two overall pick instead of looking like you in cruise control half the time. That's important to me. That's my preference. I want a rough rider, just like when Metal World Peace, before he became Metal World Peace, was on a team. I said I wanted somebody that's ready to beat up teammates if they ain't playing hard in practice and they ain't ready to fight. I like that. Everybody got their preference. I have mine. Goodbye. Ken in L.A., you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, now you're doing first-time caller, man. Go ahead. I, I, I totally agree with you. My, that's my only thing with Alonzo Ball, and he did the same thing last night. He didn't put the ball up once in the fourth quarter, man. He didn't score nothing when it was crunch time. He just gave up the ball like, man, I mean, no dog in him at all. So I, I totally agree with that. But my mm-hmm. thing is, with this NFL uh, NFL players, you, you know, they – uh, Colin Kaepernick came on and he said he was protesting police brutality and social injustice. I haven't heard anything about the police brutality, and that money is not going to affect po- police brutality one bit. The only so, thing so, 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 that- hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me, let's make, let me just make sure that my audience knows what you're talking about. The NFL has agreed that over the next seven years, they will contribute in excess of $89 million dollars. Uh, to worthy causes in an effort to address some of the issues pertaining to the African-American community. Uh, You have a player in Eric Reed that has distanced himself from the players coalition negotiating with the owners because he says the Malcolm Jenkins of the world, the uh, Anquan Bolden's of the world, that he's not on par with them. He's not on the same page as they are as it pertains to uh, the negotiations with the owners. That's the subject. What specifically, sir, are you trying to say, Ken? I, I, I'm trying to say that Colin Kaepernick is the one who stepped up and, 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 and brought this to the forefront. No one else said anything and would ha- would not have said anything. And and no one has addressed police brutality. You know what? They want Colin Kaepernick, like Shannon Sharp said, they want the NFL's uh, the, like just those owners using using their sway 
with, with with these politicians and everything, like when they get these stadiums passed, well, I want you to put the pressure that these police departments around this country cannot shoot unarmed black men and women the way that they do. Whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop it. Who the hell hasn't put pressure on the police department in that regard? That's everywhere. That's number one. Number two, this is a sports show. Number three, and more importantly, let's be clear about something here. The fact of the matter is, is that when you're talking about the NFL, the NFL aren't the individuals guilty of police brutality. The NFL isn't the individuals guilty of racial oppression. So in other words, when you, with the reason why the NFL is relevant is because Colin Kaepernick, an NFL player, used the platform of being an NFL player during an NFL game, kneeling for the national anthem. Kneeling for the national anthem to bring attention to racial inequality, oppression, and police brutality. People weren't kneeling then. You didn't have a whole bunch of people that were kneeling then. They didn't band arms together and take a knee until President Donald Trump came out and called them a bunch of SOBs, which means it wasn't about supporting Colin Kaepernick. It was about coming to their own defense against the president they obviously have ill feelings about who called them a bunch of SOBs. That's how the NFL owners really, really got involved. And the proof is in the pudding. Because while we're talking about the $89 million and while we're talking about addressing these issues, et cetera, et cetera, the one thing that nobody has brought up is the demand that Colin Kaepernick be returned to an NFL roster. So the point is, is that there's a whole bunch of stuff that people can debate about that, Ken. There's no way around that. And I don't want to hear about wanting folks to put pressure. Anybody that's black, any minority that's in this country, that recognizes what has been transpiring between law enforcement officials, some of them, and various minority communities throughout this nation, have an obligation to mention it, to broach it, to discuss it, etc., which this show and many others have done. We don't need Ken coming from the peanut gallery telling us that we need to do more when, in fact, everybody in all facets, political talk radio, news talk radio, music, hip-hop, et cetera, et cetera, everybody's been doing it. Nobody has turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to that. But at the end of the day, you don't have African-Americans owning an NFL team. You have a bunch of white billionaires who ain't going to relate to the plight of the black community. So there's only but so much you can hope for and expect. And that's the reality. Are you willing to accept that? Yes. On my way out, why, why, haven't, why haven't those players stood up and said Colin Kaepernick is going to have to I agree be, with you. Uh, why haven't they? That that's a damn good question because they haven't done it. They're talking about money. They're talking about causes. But they ain't talk about that. They haven't talked about going up on Capitol Hill and, 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 and asking the owners of the National Football League to use their cachet, their prowess, and facilitate these players going on Capitol Hill to get legislators to address these issues. We saw Theo Reddick and Amir Abdullah for the Detroit Lions, along with various other players spread throughout the NFL, get into squad cars with law enforcement officials to see what's actually going on in these communities. But in terms of a collective Organized effort? We haven't seen that, Ken. Why is that? Not at all. Man. Thanks, brother. Thank you. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-SAY-ESPN. Everybody want to stick out their chest and bloviate. Everybody want to talk. But at the end of the day, as my man Joe Madison with Urban View Radio every weekday morning from 6 to 10 a.m., always say, what are you going to do about it? Anquan Bolden and Malcolm Jenkins is at the table with the owners trying to get things done. Got them to commit to $89 million and Eric Reed for the San Francisco 49ers. Not only complaining, but he's going to go public with his dismay with the players. So now you look like a divided front. And then you wonder why these folks look at you and say, what the hell are you doing? What the hell are you talking about? Because you ain't together. That's why. Who needs folks to divide and conquer us when we do it our damn self? Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. I don't mind, ladies and gentlemen, showing you when I'm pissed off. Because, see, when I saw... 
Eric Reed speak out against Malcolm Jenkins and Anquan Bolden, two highly intelligent brothers sitting across from billionaire owners who have no interest in the plight of minority communities, and I'm not speaking negatively about them. I'm just saying they're businessmen who are trying to make more money on top of the billions they already make who aren't African-American, who are not Latino. That's not where their interest lies. But their interest does lie in the NFL. The protests have affected revenue because it's affected ratings and beyond in the NFL. And as a result, they want to protect the cash cow. Not only for themselves, but for the players who get paid. Eric Reed's in the midst of making $5.6 million. I'm not trying to imply that he's supposed to be thankful. I'm not surprised. I'm not, I'm not trying to imply that he's supposed to just step and fetch it and do whatever they want him to do. That's not where I'm going here. I'm simply making a statement that you're an NFL player. The NFL is not responsible for police brutality and racial inequality and oppression. You made your problem their problem. And that's fine. Because when you're protesting, that's how you do it. But what you don't do is send players as a coalition in to negotiate with owners, and then when they get what they think they can, you turn around and turn your back on them publicly and denounce them. Because what you've done is now show that you're divided. And what you've done is now revealed that you're not protesting. Against those specific causes, you're protesting against the establishment. And the NFL is a part of the establishment. So because they are part of the establishment, now you've let them know you have a problem with them, which is an entirely different argument than what the protests were about, which means now you start all over, you're all over the place. You collectively bargain and negotiate this. The union should be first and foot, and they should be in the forefront of this. But now you don't have a unified voice. You look divided, discombobulated, disorganized, all because Eric Reed opened his mouth. You think as a player, you bring the NFL come crashing down? I'm sorry. Nuno, Cat, Jonathan, all of your listeners out there, you think the NFL owners are going to go broke if they don't have the NFL? They will miss out on the cash cow that they have, meaning generating future earnings. They already got their billions. I swear to goodness, sometimes this don't make any damn sense to me. I just lose it with folks sometimes. Don't make any damn sense. Makes me sick. The players were supposed to be together. Together. United as one. And instead, you're all over the damn place. And by the way, guess who the hell we haven't heard from? Colin Kaepernick. This ain't about him. This ain't about protesting for him. This ain't for him. But damn it, you would think if you instigated the process, you wouldn't disappear. You know what? I'm going to be cool. It gets to a point where some people ain't even worth my energy. Ain't even worth it. All these folks want to sit up there and they want to talk, 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 talk. NFL is guilty of a lot of things, y'all. NFL ain't perfect. Roger Goodell ain't perfect. Bob McNair, the owner for the Houston, Texas, who talked about the prisoners. You can't let the the, the inmates run the prisons. When we know good and damn well he meant you can't let the inmates run the asylum. It was still inappropriate. It was still wrong for him to say. It was still denigrating. But we all know that's a phrase that's customarily used. When there's racism to be addressed, I ain't running. When there's oppression to be addressed, I'm not hiding. When there's inequality to be discussed, I'm all for it. Ain't nobody hiding this way. This is Stephen A., baby.
I ain't running from nothing. But you got to make sense. And you got to be fair. And more importantly than anything else, you got to be united. Where the hell is the union? Why are the players out there willy-nilly operating independently of the collective body that is the NFL Players Union who's supposed to be representing them? Why is that happening? And how could you, Eric Reed, publicize your dissent that way against Malcolm Jenkins and Anquan Bolden? You should be ashamed of yourself, brother. And I got respect for Eric Reed, but not on this. You had no business publicizing that. And I'm going to say this again. Maybe I'm a fool. And I'll accept anybody who wants to call me that. It's fine. But here's the thing. I don't expect people who are not black, who are not poor, who are not a part of a desolate and disenfranchised community to be overly sensitive to those that are. I expect them to look out for their best interest. Jenkins and Bolden and those boys got those owners to look out for interests that were not their own because they made sure it connected to the owners of some capacity. And they were doing just fine until Eric Reed opened his mouth publicly. Now you look divided again as black people. Congratulations. Hour number two up next. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. Jody Avergan here. I'm glad you're enjoying 30 for 30 podcast, part of a special collection of sports audio documentaries from ESPN Films. We're finding the best sports stories for you right now. And to do that, we're behind the wheel of the mini countryman, the biggest mini yet. Please proceed to the highlighted round. To find great sports stories, you have to get out into the world and follow your instincts. That's where the Mini Countryman's all-wheel drive comes in handy. With all four, we can chase down a story in the city, the country, and most places in between. Podcast equipment isn't very bulky, but even if we're hauling a lot of gear, there's plenty of cargo space for all your stuff. And if a few of our producers tag along, no problem. The Mini Countryman comfortably seats five adults. The Countryman may be big, but it still drives like a Mini thanks to the twin power turbo engine. No matter what story you're chasing, the Mini Countryman will help you find it. It's available now, and so are 30 for 30 podcasts. Visit miniusa.com slash countryman today. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Hour number two. The Stephen A. Smith Show here with you. For the next hour over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, that's Sirius XM Channel, lady. Number to call up as always is 866-729-3776. That's 866-SAY-ESPN. 866-729-ESPN. Um, I've said what I had to say on the matter. Because I'm not trying to come across as somebody that's that's remotely trying to be disrespectful towards Eric Reed of the San Francisco 49ers. I respect the man. I'm not even a pro- I don't even have a problem with his position. I'm saying... That's not something you publicize when you got an $89 million commitment coming because your words can potentially get in the way of that. And that's the most important thing. Could you have gotten more? Should you have gotten more, whether it be in money or commitment from the owners or some other capacity or something? Sure. But you don't mess with that. Anyway, spent hour number one talking about the Lakers Warriors. I talked about Clay Thompson, a future Hall of Famer, potentially with his shooting marksmanship. Talked about what I saw from the Knicks. Talked about the Dallas Cowboys and the Redskins, which is a complete waste of time. I don't even want to. Why? Who cares about this game tonight? Who cares? Redskins will probably win because the game is meaningless. They only lose when it, it matters. When it doesn't matter, the Redskins will find a way to win. They only they they they, they, they mess up when they, when they, when there's everything to lose. So you got that going on, and the Dallas Cowboys outscored ninety two to twenty two in three games since Ezekiel Elliott's been out. I mean, we were just having a debate three weeks ago as to whether Carson Wentz or Dak Prescott should be the quarterback you choose. We've gone from that to Dak Prescott falling off the map. And by the way, is anybody going to bring up Des Bryant? Des Bryant hasn't had a game for over 100 yards in the last 13, 14 games. 
And since Ezekiel Elliott has been out, nobody's had a 100-yard game. I mean, this is some embarrassing stuff. Meanwhile, Kirk Cousins pads numbers but doesn't win. I I just don't know what to say. I really, really don't. Back to the phones we go. Let's go to James. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, James? Hey. Hey, what's up, Stephen A.? We love you out here over, over here in East Los Angeles, too, brother. You're doing the right thing, man. I, I was going to make a point. I was going to make a point about my about my Pittsburgh Steelers. And, yeah, they're turning into a little bit of, of a diva-ish team. But I got something to say to you today, Stephen A. Did you feel those threes by Lonzo? That three by Lonzo. That three goodbye. by Lonzo. Goodbye. 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 This is not an R&B station. You don't get to sing on my show. See how easy it is to cut you off? I control the mic, ladies and gentlemen. It will behoove you to listen to what I say because I can just simply cut you off. You don't get to sing, and oh, by the way, a couple of threes by Lonzo, that's what you're bragging about? Now, what if he shoot bricks the next game? Where are you going to be at? James, shut the hell up. Grow up. And next time you call up to the show, have something to say. Don't spend time holding for some stupid nonsense. Ralph and Callie, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Ralph, hey, go Stephen ahead. A, how you doing? I'm all right. You're live on air. Go ahead. I got, I got a quick question, man. Um, what do you think the struggles are truly about the Thunder not not performing the way they should Oklahoma be Oklahoma City Thunder is struggling because Billy Donovan is struggling as a coach. He's a college coach that's been elevated to the pros, that's having a difficult time managing a three-headed monster that is Westbrook, Mello, and Paul George. I personally think that Paul George is the most efficient of the three, but Russell Westbrook needs to be that alpha dog because he's going to create shots for those guys. Carmelo Anthony can score on anybody, but he's older. He has lost a step. It takes him a little longer to gain separation and to do what he does offensively, and that doesn't work schematically with what they're doing offensively, and it's a problem. And as a result of that, not only that, they can't guard the pick and roll. Let's make sure we point that out. Uh, their the defense has been suspect. How the hell is Aaron Gordon drop 40 and 15 on you? I know the kid is good, former slam dunk champion, but are you kidding me? 40 and 15? 40 and 15? Come on. You can't let that happen. I forgot what the brother's name in Houston was, but he called up and said that, you know, Mello arriving in Oklahoma City, that was definitely going to be hazardous to them or whatever. I'm not blaming Mello per se. I'm looking at Billy Donovan because you got to know how to manage this. But he went, look, he's, he's in no position to be accused of being wrong at this moment in time. My listeners are my family, except for people like James who sings. And if you're going to sing, don't have a jacked up voice. Only I get to have a jacked up voice and sing on the Stephen A. Smith show. Nobody else. This is not a democracy. But that's why I'm telling you right now, Oklahoma City, I mean, they're a problem. And, and I don't want to I don't want to advocate this, but if you're saying Presti, you might have to make a coaching change if this continues. Do you think Paul George will get traded? Um, it's possible if he shows a willingness to leave this summer. It's very, very possible. If he shows a willingness to leave, it's quite possible that that may happen. You're absolutely right. It, it, I mean, listen. I would, I would be looking to move him. I would, I would be looking to move him rather than lose him for nothing. I would do that. Uh, yes, I would. Do you think Mark Jackson would be a good fit? Of course, I do. But I don't know if Sam Presti and those guys want to hire an alpha dog like Mark Jackson, who's not going to be a puppet as a coach. He's going to get in your face. He's going to be demanding. He's going to hold you accountable. But he's also going to know what he's doing. Me personally, I think the ideal landing spot for Mark Jackson will be New York because he'll have the support of the New York community. Former star at St. John's, former rookie of the year with the New York Knicks, you know, a product of O'Connell Park in Queens, New York. You damn right New York is going to stand up, raise up, and support him. But would I like to see him in Oklahoma City with this crew? Hell yes. Absolutely. But I don't think Sam Presti would do that. That's just me. Got to run. Mike, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, big baby. How are you? Hey, man. How you doing? I'm all right. Go ahead, uh, man. The game last night was real good, man. Longo finally stepped up to the challenge. Like you said, But what we got to look for now is, is it just because the Warriors was in town? Because you know everybody get up for them. Do you think he can continue doing what he's doing? Well, listen, he got to continue doing what he's doing. But everybody, you know, like you have idiot callers like James who was just singing because Lonzo had a good game. I'm very proud of the game that Lonzo had. I hope it continues. 
I hope nobody is, is interpreting my words to mean that I want him to fail. That couldn't be further from the truth. I want this guy to succeed. But if you're not out there being aggressive and trying to make things happen as a number two overall pick, I got a problem with you. I really do. And, oh, by the way, while I got you on the line, Mike, let me make sure I say this. I really had a problem with how butt ugly that NBA game was last night between the Sixers and the Washington Wizards. Nearly 100 damn free throws. Really? I mean, we can't we can't have that's not watchable basketball. Jim Ben Simmons alone, hack of Ben Simmons. That's what they did. Okay. How you this man shot twenty four free throws in the fourth quarter. I mean, look, 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 you you can't you can't put a paying customer through that. You can't do it. You just exactly. can't he going to the line like that, and he ain't even the center. He could have had 45 easy, like, easily last night. So, like I said, you know, we're going to just keep on seeing what Lonzo do after this. Like, like, And I'm with you. I know you ain't looking for the board to fail. Nobody is. We just want him to play and show us that he was worthy of the pick, that Magic took with the pick. So, I was real impressed, you know. I was impressed how yesterday. Play, how they played as a team last night. And um, Brandon Ingram, he did all he could do last night. And I like how Kevin Kevin, and that, Kevin got, um, Durant, you know, whispered into this, hey, man, you played good last That's night. That's right. It was real real class on, you know, how Golden State handled them last night. No and question. A, the- Golden State was very, very classy and supportive of them last night. I give them a lot of credit for that. They are class personified. And when you look at it, when you look at it from that perspective, Lakers got some young talent. Uh, Luke Walton looks like he's got them playing together. They keep this up. They're going to win more games than they lose now. So we'll see where we go from here. That's what we're going to see. Lions are going to be the big key, like you said. He got to keep going, doing what he doing last night. All right, Mike, I got to bounce. I appreciate the call, buddy. Thanks a lot. 866-729-ESPN. It's 866-SAY-ESPN. Oh, before I go, Michael in Oakland, I got to hear what you have to say. Talk to me. Hey, uh, Stephen A. Um, honored to talk to such an icon, man. And I really like what you said about Mark Jackson. You know, we in Oakland, we appreciate what he did for the Warriors, and we're pulling for him all the way. My question to you about Clay, you know, and him being the number three option for the Warriors, do you think at some point in his career he could end up in in, in uh, L.A.? Because I kind of I kind of think he could. Well, listen, let me ask you this question. He could, but why would you? Why would he want to? I mean, if I'm the Los Angeles Lakers, I'd do anything to get my hands on Clay Thompson. I do anything to well, get my I, hands on. I'm telling you right now, I don't think the kids appreciate it enough. And let me tell you something right now: the people at ESPN should be ashamed of itself. Seriously, all of us should, all of us, because this man's daddy is a radio host for our family, and this dude Clay Thompson, he ain't no average player, man. He ain't no average player. Clay Thompson is the real deal. I don't know what everybody's paying attention to, but this kid is special. As a third option, I mean, do you see this man shoot the basketball? I ask a simple question to anybody out there. Can you definitively point to me to another shooter greater than Klay Thompson other than Steph Curry? Take your time. Take your time, ladies and gentlemen. I'll wait. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think um, if he he did go to L.A., I mean, or anywhere, man, he would be the number one. Listen, listen, listen. listen. And he's not not somebody that will take you off the dribble and and shake you down and create shots for himself like Steph. But what he'll do is he'll make shots. He'll post you up. He'll defend. And, oh, by the way, he's shooting 46% from three-point range this year. Career-wise, he shots 42% from three-point range. There's nothing to say. Michael, I got to bounce. I appreciate it. Damian Woody up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 through 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. 
Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Always my honor and privilege to have my little big brother on the line with us, NFL <laughs> analyst extraordinaire for ESPN, former Super Bowl champion, the one and only uh, Damian Woody is on the line with us right now. Big man, you made news a couple of days ago when everybody's everybody's going off about Eli Manning and the cruel and unusual treatment that this class personified franchise quarterback for the New York Giants received from the organization with the benching, your attitude was totally different. Explain yourself exactly what you felt and exactly what you're feeling today. Yeah, basically my premise was that Eli Manning is not immune to what happens to of many of players in the in the history of the National Football League, we can we can I mean we can talk about many players. The great Phil Sims, who you know who was uh, you know big time you know big time quarterback, Super Bowl winning quarterback for New York New York Football Giants. He got cut at an autograph signing. Uh, these type of things happen. It, you know I don't know if people know this, but the NFL is a cold business, and at the end of the day. Everyone is going to meet their fate one way or the other, man. So, you know, Eli Manning, his play has diminished over the years. Um, I know, I understand people have an issue with Geno Smith, but ownership signed off on this. And I think people aren't really talking about that. Ownership signed off on this whole thing. So, obviously, it's a situation where ownership doesn't feel like Eli Manning might not be part of the equation next year. Damian Woody right here with Stephen A. I want you to talk into the phone so my audience can hear you more clearly, Damian. Damian Woody right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I hear where you're coming from with that, but but do you are you sensitive to the fact that this is really about Geno Smith? Had it been Davis Webb, the third-string quarterback, and you said we want to find out what he's made of, what he's all about, that's where our focus is. I think it would have been entirely absorbed differently than you benching Eli Manning in favor of a quarterback the city of New York and the fans at MetLife Stadium have seen in recent memory because that Geno Smith wasn't a guy that anybody wanted to gravitate to. Listen, I I get it. I totally understand, you know, where a lot of what you know what a lot of the vitriol is when it comes to Geno Smith. A lot of the New York Giants fans look at this situation as follow. This is he's coming Geno Smith is coming from little brother with the New York Jets, turned the ball up, didn't play well with the New York Jets, then the whole sucker punch and getting his jaw broken. So yes, I, I understand that. I will also say that Geno Smith does deserve an opportunity to try to rehab his career. Obviously, Ben McAdoo see, sees traits in Geno that, are, that appeal to his system, so he's giving him an opportunity. And listen, last thing I'll say is this. What is the downside? You've been losing with Eli. Okay, so you put Geno in, you're, gonna keep, you're probably going to keep losing anyway. What is the downside to this whole thing? Well, yeah, that's a good point. We're talking to Damian Woody right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I guess the downside is the fact that, you know, you're making this move. You're alienating a guy uh, that has been your quarterback for 210 consecutive games. You don't know what kind of player you're going to get in the upcoming draft. And now this man may end up wanting to leave you high and dry. He might want to be gone. Maybe that's the downside, Damian. Well, listen, I think the Giants are probably going to move on anyway. You're talking about a guy in Eli Manning who has a $22 million cap hit, next, cap hit next year. I don't know if the New York football giants are willing to absorb that. If they're going to move as far as rebuilding and getting a new, court, new young quarterback in the draft, I don't think they want to have a quarterback with a $22 million cap hit. Damian Woody right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Your thoughts about Phillip Rivers uh, speaking out on behalf of Eli Manning. What were your thoughts about that? Well, listen, it's, that's expected. You know, obviously there's a lot of history between Phillip Rivers and Eli Manning going back to the 2004 draft. And Eli was originally chosen by the, by the then San Diego Chargers, and he basically manipulated his way to New York. So there's a history between those two guys. Obviously, they play the same position. They have the most utmost respect for one another. So that response is, is you know, I, that's what I – that's. That's what I thought was going to happen from Phillip Rivers. Listen, Eli's a classy guy. There's no question about it. He's class personified. Phillip Rivers is the same way. So I would expect, you know, players to really stick up for one another. 
Let's stay with the Chargers, at least to some degree. Between the Chargers coming back and making themselves relevant and the Rams having the kind of season they've had, how shocked are you by what you've seen uh, from football in Los Angeles this season? Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty shocked uh, because the last time we saw the, the Los Angeles Rams last year, they were just a floundering f- uh, franchise coached under Jeff Fisher. Now, make no, no bones about it. I've been one of the, you know, the biggest, uh, you know, I've been one, one of the biggest uh, detractors of Jeff Fisher, and rightfully so. Um, so but you got to give a lot of credit to, you know, Sean McVay, young guy, comes in there, brings in Wade Phillips, and turns that franchise around and gives, you know, looks like that, you know, Los Angeles Rams team is going to be in the playoffs. Also, at the same time, you're talking about a Chargers team who came out of the gate slow, has battled back. Now, some of that has to do with some of the teams in the division, like the Kansas City Chiefs, who are just seem like they're off the rails. Um, currently, I think they're on a four- or five-game losing streak. So the, the Los Angeles Chargers are one game out of first place in the AFC West. They were actually my pick out of the AFC West, so – this thing is going to be real interesting come December. You know, it's interesting that you you bring that up because I, I just don't know. When I look at both conferences, I look at the Rams and I say to myself, excuse me, Minnesota and Philadelphia are clearly better. That's how I view it. I look at the Chargers. I'm thinking Pittsburgh, uh, New England, clearly better. Where do you see them in the grand scheme of things looking at both of these franchises in terms of the potential kind of noise they can make in this postseason? Well, Stephen A., I've always said, coach, you know, when I was in New England, uh, one of my offensive line coaches, um, Dante Skarnacki, he always used to say, get in the tournament. Get in the tournament because once you get in the tournament, all bets are off. doesn't matter what your regular season record was. When you get in, it's one game elimination. And all you have to do is be hot on the right, on the right day. So if you got, you know, these Los Angeles teams getting into the playoffs, it's anybody's game. Forget what these what these teams have done the rest of the season. You just have to play better than the other team that day. Damian Woody right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Just a couple of more topics before I let you get on out of here. We got Thursday night football. I'm never, I've never been a fan of it. I can't stand it. I think NFL football should be played on Sundays and Monday night only. That's where I'm at. College football is reserved for Saturday. Prep football should be reserved for Fridays, and that would be that should be that. That's my position. Damian Woody. However, there is a Thursday night game coming on, and I'm against this game for a different reason. I don't understand the relevancy of the Dallas Cowboys and the Washington Redskins at this particular moment in time. It was on the schedule, so obviously you got to play it. I just wish some kind of flex schedule kicked in where they could give us something other than these two teams. What are your thoughts about this? What's happened well, to these know, two teams this year? Well, actually, you know, the, the both of these teams sitting at five and six, it's, you know, when you look at it, it's, it should be a good game from the simple standpoint of whoever loses this game, they might not be mathematically eliminated, but for all intents and purposes, they will be eliminated. So you would think that you're looking at two desperate teams in the Washington Redskins and the Dallas Cowboys. And with that, the Dallas Cowboys, they have only scored 22 points in the last three games. Jason Garrett is on the hot seat. There are jobs on the line. So you would think for a Thursday night game, we're heading into December, these players should be playing. They should be out there putting forth their best efforts to try to resurrect this season well, and, and hope to get into the postseason. Damon, do you think Jason Garrett's job is legitimately on the line, knowing what you know about Jerry Jones and his relationship with this man? I do. I do. Because Stephen A., one of the things that, I, that, that tends to happen is when you're on the losing streak like the Dallas Cowboys are and things are falling off the, off the rails, and if they continue losing – and the fan base starts to turn and doesn't come to the games, and you start to see these little things happening. That's the sign when changes are, you know, when changes are, are going to be made. So I think Jason Garrett is a, is in a real pickle right now because the Dallas Cowboys aren't playing really good football right now. And if this thing continues to go, I could definitely see a coaching change in Dallas. What about Washington? Because a lot is not mentioned about Jay Gruden. But I know for a fact that a lot of fans in the nation's capital are not that high on, on Jay Gruden at all. What about you? What about that situation? I think, I, think it's a, see, I think it's the same thing. Both these teams are in the same position. We're entering the crucial month 
uh, right now in the National Football League in December. If you're going to make a push for the postseason, it's got to be now. And what I said about Jason Garrett is true also with Jay Gruden. If this thing falls off the rails in this month of December, you got a quarterback situation with Clark Cousins, who's going to potentially be a free agent. You know, you ended this season on a sour note. All of that is just a recipe for change to happen uh, with the Washington Redskins. So that's why I said this game tonight will be really, real compelling because there's a lot of stake for both of these franchises. I'm with you. Damian Woody, always appreciate you, bro. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you next week, man. Keep up the great work. All right. Thank you. Damian Woody, NFL analyst for ESPN, right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio 866-ESPN. Back with your calls and more in a minute with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. To the phones we go. Right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, 866-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Let's go. To Jeter, in L.A., you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Stephen A., how you doing? I'm all right. Talk to me. Good. Um, I just want to make a few comments about the Lakers. Um, they always play the uh, Warriors very strong. It's it's uh, They've done it the last two years. But uh, so the Lakers are what? Ten, uh, can, uh, they have 10 uh, wins right now? Yes. We're in the first quarter. Okay. This is a young team. Made up of 80, 18 to twenty four year old people. Wait till uh, January and February. Are these bodies going to be able to keep up? What are you talking about? No, no I, I just don't think they have the stamina. Who doesn't? I have mean, the I think they're going to go into it. Who doesn't have the stamina? The players. I just which uh, players. Young- which ones? All of them. For who? Lonzo. For the Lakers? Yes. These young players are not going to have the stamina? Have I don't nice, think have so. Have a nice day, sir. You're not ready. You're not ready to be on the air. You're not ready. Get it together and call back. Chris in L.A., you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A. Uh, three quick things. I, I heard you listen today on uh, ES. I, I was listening today on ESPN with Keyshawn and all that, and they asked you a question if the Lakers were auditioning for LeBron. Um, I think that's laughable because number one, he's not coming here. Lakers aren't good enough. And number two, I don't believe LeBron's coming out west because of the competition. Because not just Golden State, he has to worry about. So I'm gonna get that out the way. And I have a question regarding the Celtics. Do you believe that Danny Ainge? should go after DeAndre Jordan. And, and let me hear me out, Stephen A., because I believe if they were to enter a DeAndre Jordan, you keep Horford, you keep your core guys, but I believe that somebody that can not necessarily demoralize the ball from going to the basket, but it's something they can think, think about. Because they're already good defensively. If you plug him in there, he may be able to get him over the hump, Stephen A. And to that, you say what? <sighs> he wouldn't hurt. Uh, he'd hurt you from the free throw line, but his defense, his rebounding, his shot blocking ability, his ability to run the floor for you to go or throw it up in the air and for him to go get it, that would be big. But you're not getting DeAndre Jordan for nothing unless he wants to come there in free agency, and I'm being told he'd rather go to Houston. Oh, okay, he'd rather go to Houston. Okay. All right, well, I, I think that's a good thing because they're already so good defensively. They're solid, but they just don't have that sound shot blocker. That I got to admit to you, I like Clint Capella. Okay. Clint Capella has gravitated to what they do nicely. or he, He's gravitated to what they do nicely. I'm a fan of Clint Capella's. I've become a fan of his. I got to admit that. I, I, I agree. I agree. So I don't necessarily know how much that will play a role with DeAndre going there. You don't want two guys who can't hit free throws and can't you can't really get in the ball late in the fourth quarter or whatever the case may be. But as far as the Lakers, one more other quick point, Stanley, you know, let me go. But as far as the Lakers yesterday, I don't want to hear about the guys playing well. I mean, who doesn't get up to play the champs, Stephen? And guys in L.A. are making excuses to our fans. I'm like, everybody gets up to play the Warriors. So, I mean, I don't want to hear that. They should show up like that every night, not just against the champs. So that's just my opinion. Okay. I appreciate the call, though, man. Those are good points. Those are good points. I can't dispute any of them. You make a very valid point. I appreciate the call. Thank you. Dominic, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up? Stephen A., my brother. Three quick points, man. Uh, first, I don't think that the Giants organization disrespected Eli because not all quarterbacks get a conversation, get an, an opportunity to answer, do you want to play a half, and then we go. Owner, to, owner, you know, owner wasn't even in the building. 
The general right. manager or nobody else from upper management spoke to him. The only person that spoke to him is a guy that's lucky to be there in Ben McAdoo who will be gone by the end of the season. Right, and I understand that. I still think the fact that he had a conversation, that sets him apart from any, mostly any other quarterback. Mm-hmm. Um, secondly, I, you give, my, you give my, my fans a lot of flack, man, and I understand why. I, I understand Florida, why. I start right there. Start right there. Start right there. I give who a lot of flack? My skins, my red skins. Okay, well, don't say the skins. Say their name. You know why? Because you're assuming everybody knows it. Nobody gives a damn about your red skins. That's why you got to make sure it's clear that that's who you're talking about because they're not in the mind's eye because they're always irrelevant this time of year. Go ahead. All right. No. They give my Washington red skins a lot of flack because they, you know, they, they pretty much pedestrian a lot of the times. But I do feel like they could – they. Are a competitive team, and you can't put all of these losses on Kirk Cousins. I, I, he first of all, well, stop right there. I've never put all the losses on Kirk Cousins, A, and B, I never accused them of not being competitive. I said, a matter of fact, they'll tease you. They'll be very, very competitive, and they'll find a way to lose when it counts. They'll be just as good enough, just good enough to be average or slightly below, but never bad enough and never elite enough. That's what I've said about them. They're middle of the road, and they've proven me right every time. I understand. I, I think, you know, once they get that defense on point. Oh, Lord. Here we go. When's the last like time y'all could. won the Super Bowl? Uh, it's been a while. It's yeah, right. While. No, no, no. Give me, you're a Redskins fan. What year is it? Don't give me 92. that wild stuff. Huh? 92. There we go. 92. So, so stop it. So stop it. How many years ago was that? How about 25 years ago? Yeah, All right. my then. age. Oh, it's been a while. I, I it's do. been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. You know good and damn well it's more than a while. Have a nice day, Dominic. Take care of yourself. 866-729-ESPN. Your calls to close out the show in a minute. You're listening live to Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Folks, we go before we get on out of here. The Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Make your points quick and concise. Do it or I will do it for you. Tim in Albany, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A., big fan. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to touch on the NFL and uh, the issue with Colin Kaepernick and uh, some of the other football players. And uh, with the uh, NFL coming to an agreement to – give $87 million over the next six or seven years to the causes of the players that are kneeling. Um, What else could be done to help the players and the owners get on the same page? Well, you know, me personally, to answer that question, that's the easiest question I've ever been asked about the subject. I think these billionaire owners, obviously money talks and everything else walks, right, Andy? Right, Tim? Here's the reality, okay? The owners are billionaires. You think folks on Capitol Hill wouldn't listen to them? campaign donations, contributions, things of that nature? You think that these owners can't ingratiate themselves with players? And and I'm saying on behalf of the players, with legislators. So the legislators would listen to the players and address some of their concerns. Okay. Yeah, it makes perfectly good sense. Now, yes. as do you know of any legislators that are currently listening I do and, not. And, uh, you know, I, trying I, to tie up all I, these loose ends to help not. us get back to watching football. I do not. I have no idea. I have no idea what, what legislators are doing that. I'm clueless to that. But I appreciate the question. Thank you so much. Anthony, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, man? Hey, Stephen A., first-time caller, long-time listener. Thank you. Just calling about the regards with um, coming over Anthony OKC. Um, I know they mentioned it earlier before the season started about him coming off the bench. Wouldn't that bring a better balance to their team since their bench is so weak and they're losing games in the fourth quarter? Well, you could make that argument. I mean, it's worked for Cleveland with Dwayne Wade. The problem is Melo's a scoring machine. See, Dwayne Wade could go to the second unit, and he doesn't feel like it's a demotion or anything like that because he's running the show for the second unit. So his activity is there. In the case of Carmelo Anthony, you never know how that could backfire. That's the problem with all of that. Mm, Okay, the thing with Lonzo Ball, I just think a lot of it is confidence. It has to do with his strength. Um, I see him missing a lot of layups, tons of layups. I just think that's confidence, that's strength, him going against, going into, into the trees 
Okay. Just um, scared to get get, get well, touched Well, you know up. what? You brought up all of that, but as far as I'm concerned, the number one thing you got to bring up is is Billy Donovan. You got to remember, I covered Larry Brown, one of the greatest coaches I've ever seen in my life. He had Allen Iverson and a bunch of no-names on the offensive side of the ball. They were rough riders who defended. Um, and Eric Snow's George Lynch, Tyrone Hills, uh, uh, you know, the Gembe Matumbos, Theo Ratliff before that, Aaron McKees and, and, and others, they showed out because they all knew what their job description was, and they performed it admirably. You know what? Sometimes it's about the coaching, too. Let's not forget that. I appreciate the call, though. Thank you so much. Let's go to Kelvin. You're live with Stephen okay. A. Talk to me. Yes, it's hard man works a good fit in their college football. Go ahead. How can I help you? Go ahead. Yes, it's hard man works a good fit for college football. I think he's a great fit. I think he can reach young minds. I think he, you know, I've worked with him extensively, as you well know. He's phenomenal. Um, he's a guy that gets it. Uh, he's he's a fatherly figure. Uh, he's a fatherly figure to me. Uh, the man is highly intelligent. Uh, he's reasonable. Uh, he's a communicator. Um, I actually think Herm Edwards could potentially be better uh, for college football than he is for pro football because college football, I'm telling you right now, Herm Edwards walks into your room, uh, it walks into your home. You're a kid that's playing football. You're going to have a problem with your mom or daddy because they're going to want you to go play for him. All right. I agree with that. And keep up the good job. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Lawrence. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Lawrence? Hey, Stephen, just just real quick. I, I think uh, Dez is getting a raw deal. I, I know everybody's saying he's not a, a good route runner and stuff like that, but if you put him in the slant, he's great. And I know he's dropped some balls this year. But So you uh, know he's quick. dropped some balls this year. He hasn't had a 100-yard game in the last 13 games, and you're going to sit up there and say that he's getting a bad rap? Hey, can I say one thing? Hurry he's getting up. like the Larry – the Larry Fitzgerald syndrome where they were saying he's done, he's done, but when you got him a good quarterback, he started balling again. Uh, Nobody said Des that. Bryant is done. They said he hasn't been producing to the level that he used to. That's accurate. Okay, but also I, I hate to bring – God, I hate to bring Romo into it, but when, when they did the fade routes in the end zone, what was it, 98% touchdowns? Okay. I mean – that was, when, that, was when Des, that was when Des Bryant was younger and faster. Stop it. Have a nice day. Lizzie in Westchester, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. What's up, Stephen A.? Big fan, buddy. Thank you. Go ahead. Listen, I'm a big Giants fan, and I just got to ask you. Uh, so, you know, no respect to Damon Woody, who you had on earlier. Um, it, Eli getting old isn't really the point. You know, that's something we all knew. We saw it, you know, in 2012 when he started to uh, diminish play. But my question for you is, when Geno Smith throws three picks, uh, in the first half, you know, Ben McAdoo's going to walk over in his stupid sunglasses and his dumb mustache and say, hey, Eli, you think you can, you think you can jump in? You ready to play? What is Eli supposed to say, Stephen A.? Go back what in the game. Say? What do you advise? Go back in the game because that's his job and he gets paid to do it. And it's not his, you know, I mean, it, it is Mac, as ignorant as McAdoo is, that's your job until it isn't anymore. We, listen, none of us, do you work under ideal circumstances, Lizzie? Do you love your job every day and everybody you work for? Ah, uh, no, you're right. Does it, does it stop you from performing? No, sir. There you go. That answers your question. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for the call. Ross in New York, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Say, hey, Stephen, I'm going to put you on the spot just because I follow you every day and I, I need to do this. Um, you made a comment weeks ago, a long time ago. A gentleman called when you, we were talking about race relations and everything. And I understand it's a big part of the play. And what happened is, is you told the gentleman that he shouldn't be, as a black male, he shouldn't be calling about and making issues about, about, um, about racial relations on certain, about racial issues on certain issues because there's a, there's a theme you have, Stephen, which is called the boy who cried wolf. So basically what you tell people, and it's true, I follow the same thing with my children, is that you don't keep going, you don't keep saying, you know, don't cry wolf a thousand times so then all of a sudden, you know, no one's going to believe you when it's really, really true. So what my point is this is that uh, that didn't make much sense, but my point is this. It didn't make much sense, but go ahead. Okay, so let me, just, let me get to the point. The point is this. You, you made, got 30 you got seconds, the, though, but go ahead. Know, you, okay, you, got on the, you got on the air yesterday, and you, and you equated Eli Manning's situation to, to um, and Geno Smith's situation to a little bit of a, a, a racial situation. I did no such thing. Blood. I did you no didn't? such thing. No, I did not. No, no, no I did you not. Didn't make a, you didn't make a, a racial I'm issue a, out of it, but you no, connected no, the two. No, no, no. What I said was 
The Giants have never started a black quarterback in the history uh, of their franchise, and they're the last team in the NFL franchise to start a black quarterback. But guess what? This ain't the one we would have wanted. That's what I said. Yeah, but you're well respected, and I could be turned around and misconstrued. I don't give a damn. Hold on. I don't give a damn what could be turned around and misconstrued. I know what I said. I know what I said. If I said it and I know what I said and I speak fluent English, you can sit up there and twist anything. But I know what I said. And I'm in it. I mean, listen, it's no big deal. It has nothing to do with race. But if you want to start a first a black quarterback for the first time in franchise history, would I want it to be Geno Smith? Hell no. No disrespect to Geno Smith. But his record with the Jets speaks for itself. Talk to y'all in 22 hours. Peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN.